one of the best gifts that I ever got was um, four years ago. My dad, he never wanted to leave the village. So anything you did, you had to go visit him in the village. Like that was it. You, you had to come all the way from America, get off in Dar es Salaam and fly three hours to go to the village and see him. Oh, cool. So yeah. So like when I was working as a dietitian, I only got two weeks of vacation to come back home. And it was very hard for me to actually only have two weeks. If I have two weeks, by the time I come in and tell when I leave, it's time is up. Yeah. So if I want to go see my father, sometimes it used to be a challenge. But then when I switched over and was doing travel, I like there was time I'd spend like two weeks with them. I just went there and of course I had my laptop with me working and the internet was working great. And I would just sit there and just watch my dad, just like he's drinking his tea slowly. And like I used to bring him like cookies. He loved cookies. Used to bring him cookies. He would sit there and just sip and eat a cookie. Very peaceful birds singing in the background, the, the like sounds and everything. Very peaceful. And I would just look at him and just smile and he would just smile back at me. And I did that, I think, probably like four times, four or five times. When he was passing away two years ago, zero regrets. I was like, dad, go in peace. Because you and I, we had enough time. Yeah. <laughs> we shared enough time. That was like one of my best gifts that I like, like, literally, from just switching over to travel and having that time and appreciating time with people. That mm-hmm. was the best time that I ever spent. And I couldn't have done it if I was... If I stayed being a dietitian and not following my passion. Born and raised in the motherland, chasing a better life. Story of an immigrant. Concrete past. Concrete pasture. Hello, family. You are listening to Concrete Pastures. I am Nancy Mulemwasisi. Being an immigrant has been one of the most challenging and extraordinary experiences of my life. It inspired me to create a platform to reach out to my fellow immigrants and dreamers. The goal is to provide a space for myself and others to share our stories as we deconstruct the world's view of immigrant status. We discuss issues that are important to us in the diaspora. We celebrate the joys, the laughs, the bravery that being an immigrant brings. Happy New Year, family. Wishing you and your loved one a healthy and prosperous New Year. Thank you so much for tuning in. We appreciate your support to all of our new listeners. Welcome to the family. You can continue to support us if you haven't already by downloading our app on Google Play. It's completely free and you have access to our whole library of our YouTube conversations and our podcast, our website and social media. While you are there, feel free to support us by donating or by buying our merch, which supports our veteran that makes them. We love hearing from you. Our guests love hearing from you. So feel free to reach out to our guests directly on their social media and let them know what resonated with you from their story. A huge shout out to FMG Radio for continuing to support us and giving us visibility on their platform. On this episode, our next guest, oh my God, I was so excited to meet her when we met. We met recently at the Points Guy Awards, Erica Hackman from the Nomadic Network. She's been on the show. She introduced us. And right away, our next guest told me, I'm going to be your next guest. So here she is, and I'm so excited. I was excited that she even said that. I was like, okay, I'll take you up on it. And her name, a little bit about her, actually. Her name is Justa Lujwagana, a Tanzanian Brooklyn Knight storyteller and a curious traveler. She was born and raised in Tanzania and later at the age of 12, Justa moved to the U.S. of A. with her brother to reunite with her family. After a few years without visiting her country due to her studies, 
On her return, she rediscovered how beautiful her homeland was as a local tourist and beyond. She founded Curious on Tanzania in 2015 out of her own curiosity for the country, but also to help travelers unlock richer travel experiences within and outside the country. Welcome, my sister. Oh, thank you. Thank how you. How are you? How are you? Salama, how are you? Hey, you guys. Yesterday, it. I actually asked Siri. I'm like, Siri, how do we greet? Okay. Do you know I actually <laughs> do how to speak Swahili? So I was just like, yeah. um, uh, it's been a while. Let me just get the help of Siri. <laughs> Series like yes. no, I don't speak Swahili yet. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go to Google. Siri said you speak every language. <laughs> I, I know. So I thought she did. Habari. I thought she did. Yeah, Habari means how are you, or like yeah. in another way, it's like what's the news? Like the shop, the news, like Habari. Um, in Salama is basically I'm at peace. I'm okay. I'm fine. Salama, That's what it means. It. Just Salama, just like how Dar es Salaam. Um, yes. The city of Dar es Salaam, the, the, uh, the Salama or Islam means peace at the end of it. Yes. So I'm actually right now in Dar es Salaam. I love it. I, that's why I do <laughs> actually go to Dar es Salaam. My mom's um, cousin used to live there because her husband was a diplomat. They used to live there yep. for a very long time. My mom used to travel there back and forth. I used to see the yeah. pictures, the beach, the beautiful. My mom always used to rave about the food. Yes, um, yes. The food is delicious and everything. So let's get into it. Let's get into it. How was, you know, I know you came yeah. here 12 years old. Let's get into it. Uh, I know it's, a, it's at a young age, but do you remember anything growing mm-hmm. up in Tanzania? Just share with us a little bit. Oh, wow. Do I remember? I think that's one of the one of the moments in my life that I will never forget because it was so such a significant time in my life. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's part of kind of like my history or her history, I guess I could say. Growing up, I had like different experiences. So like I was raised by my grandparents, um, my grandmother exactly, like two of my grandmothers raised us because my mom was looking for various opportunities and she was always looking for like, where can she take her kids for better education? It's five of us in the, um, it's a five of us and she's number six. So it's six of us in the family, but she has five kids. So she always wanted to have like the best education. And one of the things that, one of the things that she did with my grandmother, also my grandmother was very much about education because she did not get the education, but she made sure her kids got education. And then when it came to us, she wanted us to have a better education. So I think I was five years old when I went to school in Uganda. And this is in 94 that was doing the genocide in Rwanda. It was, ooh, it was crazy. But Uganda was peaceful enough for me to be able to go to school there. And I learned a lot. I learned how to crochet. I learned how to dance. I learned how to cook. I learned how to become a woman while I was there. I learned different languages. I speak like six different languages. So picked it up while I was there. Actually from crocheting, I bought my first car in the US crocheting. But like it was such a life skill experience. And then when I came back home in Tanzania, it was always, again, language was po- uh, poured on you. So you had to learn a new language it was the different cuisine the different cultures it was oh my it was so much and of course how to become a woman Um, my grandmother was always there to kind of teach me how to become a woman um and what this is who we are like we come from the royal family so it was always like everything has to be proper this is who you are you always have to be proud of who you are you always have to do this that um so it was a very uh humbling experience that i grew from uh, coming from there and then then moving on to the U.S. is a whole different experience, a whole different ball game. But my childhood was always a happy childhood. We had more than enough. We lived in a huge house, and it was it was good. Except like they just wanted us to get a better education. Uh, so that was the migration to the U.S. for better education. I, I want to take you back to what you just said. Was growing up also for me? It's it's like they groom you to be yeah. a woman constantly they tell you how to sit properly how to mm-hmm. dress properly how to this do you have any tradition that you could share with us because with with us 
once you, I guess, hit, once you get your first period, they have a ceremony that they normally have where they teach you how to be a wife, really, at that <laughs> age. <laughs> yep. And it, it was mind boggling for me. My, my yeah. mom never allowed us to have that ceremony because I guess mm-hmm. she just didn't want her kids because she has three girls. She didn't want, but even though we, my grandmother kind of groomed us, like you have to be a certain way, you have to be a certain way. Mm-hmm. There's no TV, so nobody really teaches you a lot of things. What do you guys, uh, what do they teach you guys as a grooming part to be a woman? Because I'm always curious about those things. They do it for girls, but not for men. Yes. Um, so for us, I grew up slightly different because I grew up like my grand, my grandmother was married to a chief. Mm. And so we grew up as, um, and my mom, of course, was a princess um, before it was abolished in 19, before we, when we got our independence. But even then, they still treated us as. So when my mother was growing up um, as like a part of, let me say, like a chiefdom or the royals, they had certain things that they did. They were, of course, like mannerisms. They certain manners that they actually followed a little bit of the British mannerisms. Yeah. We had a little bit of that. That I guess that's the modern portion of it, but also the Tanzanian. It was, it was slightly different. Of course, you had to know how to cook. After a certain, as soon as you turn like at least around 11, Eleven, like a ten, nine, nine years old, eight years old, nine years old, ten years old. They yeah. started teaching you of how to become a woman. So cooking, cleaning, you're going to fetch water with like their doubts, and it's like such a such a young age, but you had to learn those life skills because those skills at that particular time were important. And just in case if you were to get married off somewhere, you had the life skills as a woman. So they actually the gender roles are very defined and they start teaching you those gender roles way earlier on. So we got, I did it as optional. It wasn't like a must that you must do it because like our grandparents wanted us to get like a better education. So we did not have to, but like I did it with my friends, like fetching water. What else did we do? We did like so many fun things, like going to climb mango trees and get mangoes and um, traditional, like, like, let me say like there's some tribes where they do like the circumcision and all of that. That was not a part of our tribe. We never did that. So that was not something that we did. But like, let me say the Maasai's would do that, but not in our tribe. Like Tanzania has 120 tribes. So each tribe, and Tanzania is big. It's almost like two, twice the size, uh, two and a half size, size of Texas. That's how huge it is. We are the size Um, of Texas. Yes, we are like literally twice. Yeah, you guys are the size of Texas. Yes, we are the size of Texas. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we are two times the size of Texas. Um, two and a half, kind of. So within Tanzania, with the various tribes, each person practices something different. And and so we were taught slightly different from what other cultures would teach you. So like if you speak to another Tanzanian from another tribe, mm-hmm. they will share a different experience from my experience. So it's not like general, every Tanzanian has the similar, like the same experience. It might be similar, but it's not the same experience. No, it's, it's the same thing in my country because um, I thought we had a lot. It, we have 73 dialects, which is the tribes. And it's the same way that you're saying, the Lozi is like, for me, I'm Lozi. I have a different experience from someone who's Bemba or Nyanja. They all have like different experiences. How was your experience in Uganda? Was that boarding school? Uh, yes, boarding school. I went there when I was five years old. Just imagine if you have a five-year-old child taking them to school. Like, I did not know nobody. It was one day they told me I was going to school to learn English. And like, Uganda, because at that time in the early 90s, Uganda had like the best education uh-huh. in compared to Tanzania. Because Tanzania was predominantly when you go to school, especially primary school, the first language you had to learn was Swahili. And then English was like secondary. So my parents, what because like my mom knew that she wanted us to come to the us she wanted us to kind of have a heads up so she took us to school in uganda actually it was my grandmother who emphasized on it because like she knew the nuns and she was yeah. going to church that church is a big thing here so when she was going to church the nuns and also the priest recommended that hey you could take your kids to this school so they were able to i was the first one i was the guinea pig out of my whole town i was the guinea pig <laughs> so i went there for school 
Um, and experience in Uganda, the first year, because I was five years old, I think I was five or six, whatever age, it was way too yeah. young. Yeah. Yeah. And it was such an adjustment. One, I had to learn the language. Luckily, my fourth language is like similar to Luganda. So I had to learn Luganda first. And then after learning Luganda, then they started making us learn English where you cannot speak Luganda anymore or any other languages. You have to take on English. But like what I loved about that particular school, it just taught me how to become independent at a super, super early age where it was like... Way too attendance. early. Yeah. Way too early. Very independent, creative, just thinking on my own, creative in terms of like learning how to crochet. I was dancing. I was in so many different activities. Of course, I was learning. I was doing all the life skills, which is cooking, cleaning, everything like you had to learn. Everything was kind of within a certain grade level. You start off earlier and then that's embedded into your, your school, um, what is the curriculum? Like the older you are, the more of like life skills they include into your um, curriculum. Um, but like it was such a, even today I still remember. I still remember my experience in Uganda. Like I was there yesterday. Nice. Even until today, like when I have a chance to go back to Uganda to visit, I had a chance to go back probably like four, four years ago to visit. I went and visited the nuns and said hello and gave books. Uh, it was because uh, I studied nutrition. Um, so I give books for nutrition and I wanted them to kind of say, hey, I am here. I went to this school and it was an all girls school. So like I was like, I'm, I went to the school and I was able to do somehow good for myself. And I want you guys to know that this school works. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I go back and give back all the time. But like it was such a time of my life where I am always like it's always an honor to kind of know that my parents took me there. Um, although it was such a tender age, somebody else would take it on the negative side. But for me, I, I like now I appreciate it. So like if you compare me and my some of my siblings who stayed home with my mom and like went to school with my mom, my brother and I who went to school in Uganda, we have this independency compared to being uh, my sister's a little bit more kind of like scared to hit life just like that they just need <laughs> like, but we are like you know what i'm going back to tanzania that's it my brother came back to tanzania too but like it's that it's those life skills that you learn and you know like listen if i fall i'm gonna fall and get up like go right away and just keep on moving uh, that's what i got when i was going to school boarding school in uganda so yeah Oh, I love it. No, I went to a school like that. For me, it was boys and girls, but it was from first grade all the way to 11th grade. Yeah. The little kids and yeah, I I, I went to one of those schools and uh, it's popular here. When people here in America, they say, oh my God, how do you take your child to boarding school? It's easy. Yeah. Take them to boarding school. All all the parents think about is like, they're going to get a good education and like, education is such a huge, huge, huge thing in Africa. I mean, it's huge everywhere, but I think in Africa, it's almost like, this kid has to become a doctor and a lawyer and an engineer. So we have to take them to the best schools. A hundred percent. No, it's for sure. That's all, with the, uh, that's all they talk about. Education, yeah. the government, that's that's their selling point. Yeah. Like, it's everything, yeah. education, education. Oh. And you must become a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer. Yeah. If you're none of those three, it's you're like not you educated. You're not educated. You're not educated. Exactly. What did you go to school for? <laughs> that's a good Waste one. Time. Between those three, I tried. I survived. So Waste well, of time. I was the first thing when I went to school because, like, during this, I think it was like early 2000s. I graduated in 2003. So it was like those 2003, 2005, something like that. Everybody was going to school for nursing. Nursing, it was like, you're just going to do two years and you're going to get paid like really, really well. Like you must do nursing. So my mom, like everybody was like, oh, so what are you going to school? Because of what I was hearing everywhere, I was like, oh, nursing, you're going to get your degree very quickly and you're going to get paid. I think it was like $30 an hour, whatever the case is, like you're going to get paid amazing. And the job, the jobs are endless. Yeah. Which is no longer the case anymore. Over time like, and everything. Exactly. The jobs are endless and the pay is really good. So like I li- literally just listen to people just telling me how much people get paid and the availability of jobs so when i was going and applying for school i just went for nursing based on those two things and then i think i took one course 
and we had to we had to dissect the cadabra and i went and i was like cadavers i am not with the dead people <laughs> and then it was blood i was like i am not with the blood i switched my major so quickly to nutrition it was not even funny <laughs> so i ended up <laughs> pivoting and doing nutrition i got my masters in international nutrition Nice. And that was a whole mm-hmm. different ball game like just trying to get like cuz like they have nutrition but they did not have international nutrition because everything is based on american just wanting to work in america but me as an african i always knew that i wanted to find a way to come back home and also get back home so when i went to nutrition it was on the basis of like just seeing like so much cases even just like looking on tv at that time just looking on tv and seeing like so much male nutrition Yeah. and wanting to find a way to be able to provide uh, wanting to work in the space where I could be able to help others who are suffering with malnutrition and also just just food related understanding food and then seeing how could I be able to either create an organization or do something or work uh, my other goal was like to work for the World Health Organization Lovely. um so I actually took courses at the uh, at the UN and I actually got to understand the organ how it works and I was like mm, well so I ended up trying applying for those positions I applied and applied and applied and I had zero callbacks this is when I had already my I think I have my bachelor's and my masters got zero calls I was did like you, you do what? nutrition just... here in the US or um... yeah I did nutrition in the US yes so at 12 years old did you start to do high school or no or you graduated when I came to the when I came to the US yeah I came in middle school so like I started from middle I came in middle school in 7th grade and I got skipped to the 9th grade and then I just continued from there Got it. No, because I know our education yeah. is a little bit higher than when I... Yes, exactly. The education is slightly... Especially when it comes to math and sciences. The only yes. thing is different history. Yeah. It's like, I don't know American history. I know world history, but I do not know American history. I, I mean, I knew know. American history briefly, but I also knew world history. But not, like, the intense American history, like Texas history or something like that. I'm like, oh, who... It's like way too much. So that that will get me like Where like did you go when you came to the US? I thank God, hallelujah to God, my mom landed in New York. If it was anywhere else, <laughs> <laughs> I would have been like If it was like in Al- I mean, I, I love Alabama. But like if it was like I don't know where to say. I would have been like, "Mother, why are you going to Utah?" <laughs> but thank God it was New York and yeah. I've been there ever since. Nice. Yeah, but like adjusting to school in the US it was very challenging, especially coming in as an African. Everybody like the accents, like they 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 knew like you were different and like I couldn't fit in with like typical Americans. I always had to fit in with like the Caribbeans because they kind of yeah. had the same journey like any immigrants kind of we all kind of had the same journey so we clicked to, with each other and then everybody else saw us as the outsiders especially the way you dressed if you yeah. didn't have name brands on it was like you were not it if you didn't have, like there was there was all these things that were happening in the schools like you're the second like, person mentioning this actually I had a conversation I, with Richard and he mentioned the same way because he was living in Manhattan I thought it was in Manhattan Manhattan thing. No, But, no, no, no. This is, this is <laughs> everywhere. This is everywhere. I went to school one day, like my mom took us to buy shoes. So we walked and bought shoes and that had brand new shoes. Brand new shoes to an African child is brand new shoes. Brand new yeah. shoes to me, it was brand new shoes. Yeah. So I walked into the school, I had these sneakers on, I think they were white and something was like some pink or something, whatever color. I walk into school, my jeans on and like a white t-shirt on and like I had all my like sneakers and I walk and I'm so proud, like I have new sneakers. This girl came and busted my bubble. She was like, are you wearing sneakers from Payless? And I was like, oh man. And then that's when I came to know what Payless was. Like no other kid wanted shoes from Payless. I'm like, but shoes is shoes. Like, yes, I lived in Payless for a minute. I love Payless. You could in my school you had to have Jordans on, you had to have like Timberlands on, you had to have like all the name brands. Wow. That's how because it was also predominantly black, but like you had like all the brands, all the brands yeah, like in Mount Vernon in Westchester, all the brands you had to have you were like the cool kid. But I never fit in that. That always anyway. boggles my mind. Like I'm not yeah. into the name brand situation. Yeah. I if I just like to wear things that are that, that look good on my body 
and whatever exactly. that you want. So even like Payless, I've been in Payless. I haven't been in a long time, but I, I've been in Payless. I don't even know if that's still open now. But it's not when open I first came to America, I used to go to yeah. Payless. For, for, uh, I used to do babysitting. So I would buy sneakers. Why would I waste a good sneaker for babysitting? Exactly. <laughs> when you could save money so you could come build your house in Africa. <laughs> Yeah. No, <laughs> like, that's you crazy. Your money wow. Your house in Africa. Like, why not? That's what we did with our house here. <laughs> yeah. No, that's crazy. I, I, I thought it was only for rich kids. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. When I was in school, um, in US, we were lucky to go into the ESL program, like English as a second language. Yes. So that helped a lot. Like even, even when I like knew English, like. In on pretty good terms. Yeah. I just put myself back in ESL. I was like, ESL, you were picked upon because you were in ESL. Like, anytime you're different, these kids always picked up on you. But like, we were picked upon because we were in ESL. But later on, I got to realize that like, ESL kids, like English as second language kids, got so much attention with the teachers and the teachers helped you. And we had like special teachers who were helping us in everything that we did. I was yeah. like, why am I going to get out of having like private service for like public <laughs> I was like no I'm, I'm like a special kid I'm gonna come and stay here and get all, all these services just catered to me like why am I gonna go like I am yeah so I enjoyed <laughs> um, just using taking advantage of like ESL teachers and everyone and just getting help especially with college and everything because my mom did not also know about like what college do you go to what do you do all of that she didn't like it was all fairly new to her she was busy working probably like four jobs, like three jobs on the clock mm. um, to be able to take care of us. So we ended up like having to take care of our own selves. But like in a mix of taking care of our own selves, it wasn't like we were doing like we were just being like bad kids. Like you couldn't. We couldn't afford to be like, like to misbehave because you yeah. knew your mom was working so hard. There's no way you're going to misbehave when you see this lady. She doesn't even sleep in the house. Like we were in the house by ourselves. My sister, my oldest sister was the one taking care of us. But you couldn't, we couldn't afford any of us messing up. Any of us, any of the five of us could not mess up. Because we knew how much she was working hard to take care of us. That's, that was one of the things. So like when you went to school, it's like you went to school and you made sure you took care of yourself and your grades. And you made sure you made your mom proud. Wow. It, you know, it's such yeah. a normalcy here to have people work four or five jobs every single day. I have to answer phone calls. I have to do with ABC. I have to do this other job to take care of everything. Plus the people that are back home. Yep. Like you take care Very of your true. kids here. I'm sure your mom was taking the care people of you back guys. Home. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Tell me, tell you me. have to take care of the whole, it, it's almost like there were people who were writing to my mom at the time or whenever my mom calls and they, um, my mom would be like, oh, so um, sometimes I, she stopped doing that nowadays. She's like, oh, what should I get you? This guy was like, oh, can you give me a bus so I could start my business? A whole bus. <laughs> like, I can't feed my kids. How do I get you a bus? Like a whole bus. So some people's ideas of like, they think just because like, like, like US is when for us, like, especially like within my community, like within Tanzania, people look, at, I mean, even within the whole Africa, they look at the United States as land of like endless opportunities. And like, there's a tree somewhere where you just pick up dollars and you must send it to like everyone. So they could be able to, because everybody cannot be able to make the same money. So you have to send it to them so they could be able to live their life comfortably. But they don't know <laughs> how you are harvesting that money. Like, how are you going? Nobody cares how are you actually getting it, but they just want it. You didn't um, know there was a tree. As soon as you get to JFK, there's a tree. You start picking there was up a tree. money. Okay. Yeah, they pick up <laughs> until they come and realize. That's when people are like, oh, okay. I don't want to be here anymore. But... It's, it's, it's such a, it's such, I think people now are understanding through like, especially with like, I don't know if social media is helping or some people are just still naive, but a lot of people are understanding that. Um, like we, I do my best to educate people. Even when I'm here in Tanzania, I'm like, listen, I work very hard for my money. So if you want it, you're going to have to work harder for it. So you're going to have to provide a service. You're going to have to do something where we, money is supposed to be exchanged. It's not supposed to be given. It's an exchange. So what, what are you exchanging it for? 
don't come and cry at me and think you you're gonna get money from me or tell me all your problems you're gonna think i'll get money from you. like even therapists get paid <laughs> like you go to a therapist with your problem you're gonna have to give them money to tell your problems I and love it. it's like being an immigrant can be hard Having been away from my home country for over 20 years has allowed me to experience these hardships firsthand. Throughout my journey, I've had a lot of challenges that were hard to bear. Juggling adjustment to a new country, obtaining my immigration papers, getting married, having children, establishing my career, and finding time for myself. Even though I've always had faith, I also relied on therapy which gave me the tools to cope with the issues life brought me. My fellow dreamers, let's remove the stigma around therapy and normalize seeking help with today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp offers licensed therapists who are trained to listen and help you. Go to betterhelp.com slash concrete pastures for 10% off your first month of therapy with BetterHelp and get matched with a therapist who will listen and help in as little as 48 hours. Yeah, but our culture is, it's, our culture is such like, like our country in Tanzania, um, before, in the, um, like right after independence, we were a socialist country at once. Uh, before being a capitalist country, we were once a socialist country. So with socialism, there's the, the thing that's called Ujama. And Ujama is basically the unity of people. And it's basically, it's kind of like sharing of resources and exchange of resources. And then part of the also Ujama is like having one language that unites you. So we also had like Swahili as a language that united us all together. So if you travel in any corner of Tanzania, you will still be able to use your mother tongue which in our case you could use swahili and you could communicate with anybody around the around tanzania you don't have to use the foreign language to be able to communicate in tanzania if you're tanzanian so the advantage of what came out of the what is the socialism is the language we have one language that unites us so it's so peaceful it's so people people are willing to kind of share so we come from that environment of what we are always sharing so even if you when you go on the outside world it's like whatever fruits you bear you could come and share it with people here got it is your mom still here in america so yes, yeah, so my mom is in the US, um, but she also travels here back and forth in Tanzania. Um, but her ultimate goal is to come back and retire in Tanzania. Uh, I hope she's still not working for jobs. No, 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 she's not. <laughs> That's one thing, she, she's not. But uh, you know, the thing is like her working very, very hard was one, of course, to try to give us like a good life, but also in Tanzania, it was to build, like to build a house that we could come back to. So all the jobs, all the hard work, it was only, she knew it was only for a limited time. Mm -hmm. And every single penny, even if like she had a job one time, it was almost like $4 an hour, like $3, $4 an hour, but she would collect everything. Small, small, small here, small, small there. And then she will have it um, where she could be able to bring some money here, uh, started building it probably it took up like it would take some people it takes them almost like 10 years to build the house but like they go little by little and they build it so that's like the normal the culture how it is and what is it yeah so like that that's that's the mannerisms of how like even if you the little that you have you gotta mm. put it to like you gotta maximize on it that's how she worked out things but now she doesn't work as much anymore <laughs> Um, the reason why I asked because part of um, you've explained a lot because part of why concrete pressures exist is because of the perception everybody else in the world has about the US as an immigrant. Mm -hmm. I wanted to give people a window into our lives as immigrants. Like it's not as glamorous as you think it is just because mm -hmm. you see us on social media looking great that day and we took a lot of bunch a bunch of pictures doesn't mean this is the life that we live every single day we don't have sure. the beyonce and jay-z type of life some people long for it mm -hmm. but at the end of the day we are normal people who are hard working every yeah. single day going out there to get 
to work for every penny. America does not yeah. give anything for free. As soon as you you arrive, you're working for every little penny that you have in your bank account. And this exactly. is what I wanted to um, to give people to to understand. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm grateful that you were able to explain that what your mom has been able to give you. What have you learned from your mom's experience? My mother, oh my God, what have I learned for her? Uh, so much. Every single day is a different lesson. Persistency, just being persistent and just following your guts and like your, the dream that you have. You're going to fall so many times and she did fall so many times. There was a time where... I think she went in 89. She was pregnant with my uh, my brother, my youngest brother. Um, and things got hard. Because, like, after when she got pregnant, she they had to, uh, she had to bring back um, my brother to Tanzania. Mm-hmm. Um, so she sent somebody with my brother who was three months, came back to Tanzania. She stayed in the U.S. So postpartum is real. But she still had to go back to work. She had to go back to work. So all her five kids were in Tanzania and she was the only one in the U.S. Uh, she still had to work. Crazy jobs, almost like three jobs. At that time, she was working also at McDonald's. She was working also other jobs, but trying to collect as much as she could. When it got super hard, she ended up pulling back and coming back to Tanzania. She stayed here for probably like until like 94. And she was like, you know what? We need to try this again. Luckily, they got a visa. We were super lucky to get visas again. They got visas. They were able to fly back to the U.S. with my two sisters and her. So it's like three of them that flew. My youngest brother already had, um, he was an American, so he's fine. He could always go back and forth. And me and my brother were left in Tanzania. So going back again, starting from scratch again, and just trying to make it all over again. But she's always persisting. Even being in America, she could have gave up at any time and said, you know what, this is super hard. Living in one house with like turning the whole living room into a bedroom where she just came from Tanzania where she has everything, but now going to America and starting from scratch, she would have been like, you know what, no, I'm not doing this. But she knew her purpose for being there. Her purpose is her kids, her kids getting, getting a better education and also getting a better opportunity. And she still persisted and kept on going and kept on pushing. That drive of wanting the best for somebody else, that is what I always like remember. Even like for me with my business in my career, I always remember you always have to, when you, the more you give to others, depending, the more you kind of share and give, the more it will be given to you. Yeah. Um, but you just have to persist. That's, that's what I took from my mom. But she's, she's amazing. She's, she's, she's amazing. She's always there. My mom would drive almost like three hours just to come and just be with us for 10 minutes and then drive back, go straight to work. Lovely. Mothers. Yeah. Love them. I know, mothers. I don't know if I would be like that. I'll be like, listen, <laughs> child, <laughs> I got a party to go to. <laughs> <laughs> you will, you will. Um, I mean, we, we don't act to anything that we haven't seen. Whatever we we see, we emulate. And um, I'm glad your mom has been an amazing example for you guys. It's definitely hard. What what has America given to you? Lord, America. um, The ego. (laughs) (laughs) The confidence. (laughs) The American ego. The confidence. Okay. Of like, I think America kind of like gave me that flash... um, you know how an ego is in the, in up in the air, and yeah. could, like an ego's eye, and could kind of see like everything in in the space. Yeah, I think that's what America gave me—that eye of kind of like seeing the ego's eye of like seeing everything, including seeing what is available, or what is in Tanzania, mm-hmm. and then what is in America, and like just seeing all these various opportunities. That's what America has done for me. Do you have any regrets? Um, for my mom bringing us to the U.S.? Yeah. No. No, I wouldn't do it differently. Because I think if it was done differently, I would probably be married with like 10 kids right now somewhere in a village. Gotcha. I would not do it any differently. Yeah. So what got you into everybody? This young lady is a traveler. She travels everywhere. She founded as 
part of her intro. She found it curious on Tanzania. So what got you into curious on Tanzania, your home country? Oh boy. So it was it was like when we were when I when I was able to come back to Tanzania and like visiting, I used to mostly like when I come back mostly go and visit like my family members or tackle along with my mom, whatever she tells us to go. Oh, we're going to visit this person, let's go for dinner. Mm-hmm. Or we always going for the other one. So like I got to experience Tanzania more as a Tanzanian. Um, but then there was one opportunity which was provided by my uncle. My uncle has been in the tourism business at that time for probably like 20, almost like 30, 30 years. Um, so he came to America and like I was then a clinical dietitian working um, busy and just like working just a like typical job. Um, very, very busy. Working full time, um, going, finishing up my master's full time. And I think I had other jobs. So it was almost like I was repeating the cycle of my mom, just like working, 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 working with that cycle. So he came and saw us. Um, we did dinner with him and he was like, you guys need to check out Tanzania. Like, have you have you gone like on safari? Have you done that? We were like, no, no, no. He's like, you know what? I need to show you another opportunity of how you could be able to use the, your opportunity that you are you already in the United States. You already are within the people who are actually want to travel to Tanzania. So come and see, and then you guys let me know what, um, what, how you could be able to use, take advantage of this. Um, so it got to the time we were like, okay, we thought it was like a joke or whatever. Oh my God. We came to Tanzania. We did the typical tourist stuff that everybody else does. And it was amazing. We went to the Ngorongoro crater, with the, which is the eighth wonder of the world. We went to the Serengeti and saw like with the safari game drive, which I've never been on a safari game drive. I'm Tanzanian, but I've never been on safari game drives or anything like that. The various lodges, the rich of the rich, wherever they live. This was like a 10 day experience. He paid for everything and everything is super expensive. It was almost like $10,000 per person. It was six of us. Um, but he wanted us to see the opportunity. We went to Zanzibar. We came back in Dar es Salaam and like Zanzibar with the beaches and like it was so much. It was like such an eye opening experience. Um, when I came back to the US, I was like, okay, I have all this information. You know, when people give you like information, when you see, you yeah. come back hot hat and you want to share and you want to tell everybody so that's what i did i went out and told everybody about safaris and how great it was and everything and um and actually majority of my friends i thought they're like black so like i'll go to them and tell them and share and then they're like so what else <laughs> and they were just looking at me like what else <laughs> i was like this is great you guys are gonna love it and whatever, whatever they're like what else so they kept on saying what else and what else and what else and then there was one particular person was like i want to experience it the way you experience it when you go back home and i was like uh what is that i don't know like i then i started digging again just trying to figure like what are they talking about? what is that what else and i started focusing on that what else um, and that what else was basically, especially when it comes to the African-American who's our highest target, that what else is like seeking to find self through travel. Mm. So with that, they're, they're also looking to identify themselves. For me, I am Tanzanian. I know where my village is. I know where my cultural roots come from. So they're looking at me. They're like, oh my God, you're able to experience all of this. And also, you know where you come from. And as you also travel back, and also discover even more, we want that. We want exactly that. So once I found out, like before a company was called Keys to Safari, because I was giving you a key to Safari, very shallow. (laughs) So ended up kind of cracking down again. And like I had a couple of friends who were helping me with everything and kind of like thought, okay, okay. So one, I don't know the country that much. I'm also new at it. I can't be like, I'm a super expert at something. I am not, but I am Tanzanian and I love it. So let's all be curious on it. So that's how I created like Curious on Tanzania. It's just basically my curiosities and those tra- people who are traveling, their curiosities, let's come, come bring them together. I will go and do the self-discovery and then I'll bring you guys along and you'll be able to discover the country the way you are seeking to discover it. And then I'll just kind of mix it up and add the extra flavors in there. And of course, you do the safaris you do zanzibar but then also you whatever that your interest is to kind of figure out 
that will also be incorporated and it will be a very customized experience that you would come back and say, oh my God, that was a trip that literally changed me as a person or like brought me closer to who I am and my ancestors, especially for like African-Americans or anybody else, you know, anybody else could, they could see, we all could see ourselves within somebody else, but it has to be, we all have passions. We all have um, that, that thing that when you see it in somebody else, you're like, yeah, I recognize that. And that's the important thing when it comes to first when we were building um, like Curious on Tanzania. Oh, listen, I've been... I talk a lot. (laughs) No, 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 no. I I, I love when people are passionate about what they do. It's evident that you are, you live what you do. It comes out of you. But me meeting you and us hanging out together at the awards, it was like I have known you for a while, for a long time. The type of energy that you give. So even when you are taking everybody your clients on tour and showing them your country i'm sure they are having a ball because i've been on your social media yeah i i'm, I'm literally wanting to go and experience yeah you can't tanzania <laughs> <laughs> tanzania through your eyes because i think yeah. it's beautiful the pictures like it's endless i could sit there honestly I had to stop myself. I'm like, I need to stop. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I was going you. on and on and on and looking. I'm like, oh my God, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. They went cooking. I want to go cooking. They went this. Yeah. But those are the experiences. And it's funny that you say that, that, you know, you didn't know your country that well. It's the same thing for me. Like, mm-hmm. I know my country not that well. I mm-hmm. went to, uh, in 2012, back home mm-hmm. for the first time after a while and it was like I was a tourist. Mm-hmm. So I, I went to experience the Victoria Falls. I went to experience like all of these um, tourism, even the national park. Still, it was just like, wow, I feel like a tourist. And it was yeah. just like that. Like I felt like a tourist. But it's great mm-hmm. to have somebody who is from the country. Because no matter how long you're gone, you know the foods. You can relate. Yep. It's like, oh, hey, let's go eat, you know. Uh, I, I usually take people, I'm like, let's go eat, but we're going to buy the best chef. And when I when I get there, the chef already knows the menu. Yeah. And he knows how to do it. Right. Like, it's, up, it's the, like, the, the experiences we do is like to the next level. Like, yes, like, because I've lived in New York and yeah. I understand even like Brooklyn, like, they, there's this kind of like flavors that people look for and you could seek them out and just be like, listen, this meal needs to taste like this. I, yeah. I know I'm going to yeah. get somebody to this banana soup. Like, they're going to get it. Like, they're going to... I have people who, up to today, they remember that particular meal that I took them to eat. And they're like... And they just melt. Like, their mouth just melts. That's by, like, speaking about it. But it's because the attention to the details. Yeah. And just being, like, very keen on... um like making sure when people come to experience something, they experience it the proper way. Yeah. Um, but no, like I love what you that. Were talk- yeah, what you were talking about, like like when you met me, like the, the vibes and all of that, it takes work. <laughs> <laughs> it takes work. It takes like self-acceptancy and showing up as the person you are. Like yeah. for me, I know like even even with my accent, I will keep my accent the same way it is, you know? Because I know it will bring you it, it's also a conversation starter. Or it, it will it will help it will help me to identify myself and yeah. not blend in with everybody else. I'm like, listen, this is who I am, this is I'm gonna come. I'm like, I am here, but like I'm being represented by like Everyone who is like my ancestors and everybody like that, wherever I walk, yeah. that's who walks in with me. And I'm oh. going to show up that way. And I'm not going to hide who I am because I want to make other people feel comfortable. And sometimes we kind of like assume when we are showing up, we always have to be a neutral and not highlight your best because we yeah. are afraid that we might intimidate other people. But it's not true. You're not intimidating other people, but you're actually <laughs> opening up that conversation 
to be like, hey, this is who I am. And if you don't understand, you can always come and ask me, hey, I noticed this. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? You know? So that's why like authenticity is, is, is key. Like when you, especially like as an entrepreneur, you always have to like find your angle, find like the more you seek to understand self, the more it becomes easier for you to be able to connect with others because they, they see it. They see the true, the, your true you. They see it. Like, I know Nancy, like you just see it, like, listen, and then you could connect to people a little bit better, but it takes time to kind of work onto that. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I connected with you right away. And even when you just told me, it's like, I'm going to be your next guest. I'm like, I love it. Let's do <laughs> this. I'm like, come on, let's do this. Who are you? <laughs> I was like, no. The thing is, you understand, I guess, the, the, you understood the concept as to this is your home. This is your space. And this is yeah. uh, true to the words. This is yep. our space as immigrants to highlight our stories. And this exactly. way people can learn around the world what it's like to be an immigrant. There's no yep. hiding. There's no sugar coating. It's just how it is. This is our exactly. stories. Yeah. And we're just highlighting what we've been able to live. Hopefully you can learn a thing or two from our experiences. This way you don't have to make the same mistakes. Thank you. Yeah. The, yeah. The journeys, like we all have like similar journeys, but yet different also at the same time. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. like we are very, we as like silent about it. We are afraid to speak our truth. Yeah. Um, and like sometimes just like the more you are able to speak your truth and be your truth, the more opportunities come at you. But like we are, especially like our parents, our parents are like, we are not saying anything. We don't yeah. want like people to know that we are suffering or we <laughs> suffered. I'm like, you no longer suffering, mom. Like I'm taking care of you, mom. You know, yeah. but that story, you still need to share it because somebody yeah. else might be going through a similar journey and they want to know that there's a light behind somewhere that they could see like there's somebody else who saw the light so help them see that light too by sharing your story so somebody will be like you know what this person was able to go through it all of this i'm going through it is going to come to pass but like if that's not being shared you always feel like you're just still in that 100%, yeah 100 mm-hmm. percent this is why this platform exists so we can continue to highlight all of our stories and, Thank you, um, Nancy, for providing this. And we're always going to be here to kind of come and share. <laughs> Listen, it's our space. So you are in Tanzania now. Correct. I, I am so happy to be traveling. You know what I miss, actually? And we are busy cooking. The food smells so good. <laughs> Listen, I'm about to talk about food. Because I used to make this dish back home. One of my uh-huh. Tanzanian friends taught me how to make this I, I don't know why I'm forget I, I'm so forgetful now because after being being it's a mother a cornmeal, it's a combination of the the rice uh-huh meat, and then oh pilau. pilau oh my god the rice pilau yes you guys make it so good I used to make that for the family like yep. almost, almost like on Sundays, I would make that. Like I was into yeah, yeah. making like new things because I was just tired of eating shima. Shima is all like our staple yeah. food. Yeah. It's made out of mm-hmm. cornmeal. Oh, we have that too. It's called ugali. Yeah. So it's just, yeah. I can't eat that every day. Now I don't even eat yeah. it. I eat maybe like once or twice a month. If I, yeah. but my daughter wants it. So she, she loves mm-hmm. it. So I, I make it for Aww. about. Once I make it, I'm like, oh, yeah. let me have some. So I get to eat a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> it's a lot of work, though, too. But it is a lot of work. That whole mixing. It's like, listen, this is the main Tell me. Yeah. I don't even have the right spoon now. Because my other yeah, one... The wooden you know, spoon. Yeah, I, I don't even have the right one. So I just bought whatever was in the store, the wooden one. It's not yeah. the right one. It doesn't make <laughs> the right way. But yeah, I miss making that. I try to make the, to to get the spice, and I try to do it. Yeah. it didn't come out the same. Mm-mm. When I come back, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to bring you some. Yeah, all the spices in my cabinet in Brooklyn. Oh, great! We we, we just have Everything. to do a, 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 a cook down. I'll come to your house, or you come. February to your guaranteed. House. Yes, <laughs> I'm like February guaranteed. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. No, we definitely gotta do that. 
Yesterday That's I was I always, talking to you, know, you telling me how you I always do. have events. I always have events in Brooklyn. Like I I tr- I bring like my culture or like me just like the joy of just being able I'm a storyteller. So the joy of being able to tell stories through experiences, touching food, Love it. eating, dancing and all of that. So like anywhere I am, I always bring it with me. Like I always call uh, call up a bunch of my friends or sometimes um um, clients who have, who have traveled, who have never traveled, they all come to my house um, and I make them cook because I don't cook it. I like I, I lay out all the ingredients and I'm like, today we're going to have a cooking class and you guys are going to make pilau <laughs> for yourselves. Bring wine too. <laughs> and But they people love it. Or like making banana, like banana soup or whatever. Because it's a new experience. It's that I don't know. Well. The banana love soup, it. I saw it on your oh, Insta. Oh, yeah. I, I need to oh, try that. God. I it's need to so try good. that. Yeah. It's so good. Listen, it's super good. I, I used to live through my mom when she traveled yeah. and she would come uh-huh. home and tell me all of these uh, experiences that she's had through food. Oh, I ate yeah. this. Even the pilau. Yeah. Like the first time I yes. made it at home, she was just like, oh my God, this is so good. Because, you know, it's back home, it's Zambia, so we we, we have the actual spices. Like, really oh, yes, 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 yes. Spices. Yeah. But, yeah. I, 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 this is why I, I love traveling through my mom uh-huh. traveled yeah. a lot a lot a lot oh that's good yeah hopefully so, she brought all the spices for you she didn't but we, we could buy the same we had like the spicy market i don't know if they still have it back home yeah we mm-hmm. had like the spicy market you could just go actually buy all the different spices they just weigh them for yeah. you and yeah yeah it, oh it, nice it, it, yeah it, they it, do it, that here like oh, in cool. the spices coming from Zanzibar, those are like the best. Like Zanzibar is known as the land of spices. Yeah. So you get like the best, the best spices there. Lovely. Or even in Dar es Salaam, like yeah, like if if you guys had like a smell of vision, yeah, if you could smell like the smells, like because they're cooking right now, the smells that are coming out of this house, you'd be like, oh, my God. <laughs> don't get I need me to hungry. Come there. I haven't <laughs> eaten in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me hungry. So if I'm, I, I want to have the Curious on Tanzania experience, how do I mm-hmm. sign up? How do I get to have this experience with you? Um, so one, I know sometimes it's easier like on social media. So if people go on Curious on Tanzania, mm-hmm. um, they could be able to write us a message or DM us and I should be able to reply back and give them a form that they fill out. All our website, which is CuriousOnTanzania.com. Uh, and with CuriousOnTanzania.com, you could be able to go on there. And there's a place where it kind of tells you, do you want a customized experience? Do you want to join a group trip? Or do you want to go on the like a residency trip? So you click on one of those and then you take it to a form. You fill out the form. I personally get it. I Most of the time I'm in contact with all my clients that are coming in. Personally get it. We get on the phone with you. We create, we customize a plan for you or like an itinerary for you. And once you accept everything is well, you make a payment, you come to Tanzania, we pick you up at the airport and you have an amazing time. And when you're going back home, you start crying that you don't want to go back home. <laughs> and then you're going to tell all your friends. Uh, that's how it works. <laughs> Do you guys help out with accommodation or everything is included? Everything is included. Accommodation, let me say your food, your experiences, like let me say for example safaris, cooking classes. Sometimes people want to have business meetings, that's included. Now people want to travel and look at real estate and see how could they be able to live in uh, like in Africa. So we do those first time visits and like trying to relocate. We kind of like help in terms of like getting them familiarized with the country too. So we do a lot, like all in one. That's what we call it, just curious on Tanzania. It's like whatever that you're curious on, we will help you to navigate your way. Um, but then we also understand how the world in the U.S. works and how everything is. But like we use that to kind of bring here and then we're able to customize like your experience really well. I love it. You, you've been very successful with what you are doing. What gets you up? Like, what gets you excited? What motivates you to do all of these things? I mean, you wanted, you went to for nutrition for school, yeah, and then yeah. now you are into tourism. Why the pivot? I think <laughs> I've always dreamed about. Um, it's okay. 
I've always dreamed about coming back home and finding a way to give back. I, I took a course when I was in New York. It's called Momentum. And this is a course where they help you to, it's like a life, a life coach class, I guess. You know, one of those. It's a life coach class I took. This lady, I kept on like, literally the whole entire time, I kept on crying like, oh, I wanted to become a dietitian so I could go help people and blah, 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 whatever, whatever. She was like, she just looked at me and I was like, oh, I wanted to form a nonprofit organization. She's like, just the, you know how many people are doing that in Africa and you think that's helping or they're just doing it out of their selfish, <laughs> some, some of them, not everybody. <laughs> so she was like, I don't yeah. need you. And she was, she was very frank with me. And I was like, I was like in tears. She was like, I don't need you as an African to go over there and do the same thing. I do not need you to do that. Not you. Like specifically, she was speaking to me. She was like, if you're going to start something, look at social enterprise. Look, do something with good, like for good. It's a business, but it's a, a for good business. Yeah. So it's social enterprise. So she introduced me to the world of social enterprise. So that's why I was like, you know what? When the travel, when the travel idea came up to me or they introduced me to travel, that's when I saw where my calling was. I was combining the two worlds. Like I have, I, like we work with almost like 30 people right now in Tanzania. And also there's more small businesses that we work with that we are actually supporting the local economy through the trips that we do. And like all the experiences that are provided by like, just the locals from everywhere just creatives from everywhere so that is yet still giving back and it's a way to kind of help in terms of like putting money inside of the local local economies which serves kind of like the same purpose but this is a service to service that's being passed on and it's not like you're giving something for free just like that but like somebody sharing their experience or their creativity with somebody who's interested in knowing more about that creativity or that experience so it's a it's a it's a humbling experience. Um, so that's what drives me. What drives me is just being that connecting bridge. Waking up every morning and be like, who am I going to connect these two? How am I going to connect these two worlds? Um, or like, how am I also on the selfish note, how am I going to find myself back home and just be able to be like, you know what? I am back home and enjoying life. Um, so, and this thing, the smiles, like whenever, sometimes like I go to the airport to pick up people, um, my team does it. Or sometimes I go depending on what, um, but like, I like seeing that, oh my God, I am in Africa kind of like, kind of smile or like they cry and you're like, you, you made it, you made it. Or like when they're leaving, everybody's like, oh my God, I don't want to go anymore. Like that actually does it for me because i we knew we we know like we have done what we were supposed to do it's the gift that keeps on giving it gives to everyone. yes 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 and then of course money is always a drive but like yeah. it's not as a drive compared to when i was going in a career of nursing where it was money first yeah. now it's passion first and it's wanting to see how you will contribute to everyone and then while you're contributing to everybody, both the client and the host, yeah. you are like literally you're sharing with everybody and then everything comes back to you also at the same time. So that's, that's the big difference between a career and then following a passion. Uh, I, 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 I love it. Every time you, if you put the mission first, the money will always come. Exactly. Yep. And if you're doing something not only for you, but for other people, if you're only doing it for people, it's actually great. So, yeah. And yeah. Um, it, it keeps giving back to you, whether it's financially yeah, exactly. or just yep. the thrill, the fulfillment yeah. of yeah. that, just giving back. It, it's the best. Yeah. It's the best feeling. It's the best feeling. It is. It is. One of the best gifts that I ever got was um, probably like three years or four years ago. My dad, he never wanted to leave the village. So anything you did, you had to go visit him in the village. Like that was it. You, you had to come all the way from America, get off in Dar es Salaam and fly three hours to go to the village and see him. Oh, cool. So yeah. So like when I was working as a dietitian, I only got two weeks of vacation to come back home. And it was very hard for me to actually only have two weeks. If I have two weeks, by the time I come in and tell him when I leave, it's time is up. <laughs> 
So if I want to go see my father, sometimes it used to be a challenge. But then when I switched over and was doing travel, I like there was time I'd spend like two weeks with them. I just went there, and of course I had my laptop with me working, and the internet was working great. And I would just sit there and just watch my dad, just like he's drinking his tea slowly. And like I used to bring him like cookies. He loved cookies. Used to bring him cookies. He would sit there and just sip and eat a cookie. Very peaceful. Birds singing in the background. The, the, the like sounds and everything. Very peaceful. And I would just look at him and just smile, and he would just smile back at me. And I did that. I think probably like four times four or five times when he was passing away two years ago zero regrets i was like dad go in peace because you and i we had enough time yeah <laughs> we shared enough time that was like one of my best gifts for that like, like literally from just switching over to travel and having that time and appreciating time with people that mm-hmm. was the best time that i ever spent and i couldn't have done it if i was if i stayed being a dietitian and not following my passion that would have never happened and I'll probably be at at his uh, funeral crying just like everybody else like oh my god you never uh uh-uh. I was like listen rest in peace <laughs> rest in peace because I know yeah. your time has come and everything and I appreciate your time with me I had a good time with you rest in peace yeah that was one of the most humbling um moments and just accepting time and allowing um just appreciate quality time with no, the people I, that you love. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that. I, I heard um, Steve Harvey say, your dream will make room for you. So yep. it makes for a lot of room. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm glad that he gave you time. Your dream gave yep. you time with your father. And not everybody can say that. Exactly, and Especially yep. for immigrants. It's very hard. It's like something happens to our loved one. Sometimes we can't mm-hmm. even go... And, yeah, yeah. Um, because of restrictions from work, like you're saying, the two weeks, mm-hmm. that's mostly the vacation time that everybody gets um, here when you come. Yeah. And by the time you I fly, even know, and yeah, you fly, even, it's like time to mm-hmm. go back. Yeah, I even know some people who have spent almost like 30 years, 40 years without coming back home. Mm-hmm. And like their, their loved ones are passing away because if they come, they cannot go back. Yeah. Like literally, they're like, in that so like it's so painful super painful like um yeah yeah it's very painful like 30 40 years you can't come back it's like it's yeah so like i was super lucky when you think of that it's like one of the luckiest moments that you could ever have so yeah no i'm 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 grateful for that for you at this point in your life you're very successful getting there i'm getting there (laughs) from me looking in I think you're very <laughs> successful. Thank you. That's the syndrome of overachievers. I have it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I can recognize it anywhere. So, <laughs> but me looking in, have you found your concrete pastures? I don't know if I could like put a measure to it. Like, oh my God, I hit success. This is what success looks like. I think success is just like how my mom did it in smaller bits. Success is on a daily basis. These different goals on a daily basis. So like each goal that I hit, I consider that a success. I don't consider that huge milestone as a, oh my God, I hit it. Cause like at any point you might fall. Cause like once you hit the top, top, there's nowhere else to go, but downwards. So like, I just like taking those small measures and always making sure that so success for me looks like when a client is back in the U.S. and they're super happy with their trip. That's success. That's a win. And I count all my wins are like very small wins. And I'm always on that mission of kind of like winning the small wins, small wins all the time. That's success to me. That's what I consider success. And that's what drives me every day because it's like those small wins. I always want to do the small wins instead of waiting for the big win. But let me say, if you're talking about like something that we have done, I recently bought property in Zanzibar. And I want to build like a six bedroom villa. I'm like talking that into existence. Amen. But like I got the land already, but now I want to do like a crowd fund um, to be able to raise money and then build it. And it's a space for like creatives like us. It's a space where I want, we want people to come there to be able to use the time, the quality time to create. Um, so from musicians to an author, to like just the creative, like you and I, who's who needs that moment to kind of say, you know what? 
I need to go work remotely in Tanzania for two weeks. Where do I go? Where do I find that creative space to go to and just like create with fellow creatives? That's the villa that I want to build because like I have lived, I've gained so much just from having that space and the quality time to become the person I've become. And I feel like it will also help others. I will consider that a huge success in 2024 once we get it done. I'll be like, oh. This will be helping other people to kind of like. I, I, I'll be coming to 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 the. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. need to. Uh, the thing is, I whenever I'm thinking of different ideas, different things, I have to change my environment. Yes. Whether it's just going to a restaurant to go mm-hmm. sit down or going for a walk, especially my walks when I'm trying to get yeah. my my ten thousand steps in, it's when mm-hmm. I even come up with the titles for the episodes. Yep. Mm-hmm. I um I think better there's no distractions. I could have something in my ears but still my mind is on what the plan is, whatever I'm working yep. on currently. And mm-hmm. I love the idea of having a villa or a space to hold the uh, creators because we yep. don't have that space. At least I don't yep. know about it. If they have if it is one out there, I don't know about it, but I think it's a great idea. Especially for us Africans, it would be great. Mm-hmm. I want to come and yes. be able to experience that and be able to experience your home, your country. Yep. I love you have it. A great time. <laughs> I'm like you have a great time. So that's like, that's like no, I that's love like it. One of my biggest dreams, yeah. Because like you always have. For me, I'm le- I learned everything from my mom. You build slowly. Everything comes piece by piece, piece by piece. Yeah. You can't think of like that huge million dollar dream and you think it's going to come just like that. It's everything is little by little. Like her whole she spent her whole life working on becoming. She is yeah. still becoming. So she hasn't yeah. reached there yet, but she's still becoming and she's happy becoming. Um yeah. and that's, no, that's I- the same thing that I'm taking is just I'm happy doing things becoming and bringing whoever is coming along and they just like we all leading ourselves into that journey together well said well said because we we are yeah. all on that journey of becoming for a hundred mm-hmm. it's every day but you have to work at it every single day exactly you have to do it every day it's every yeah you have to do it every day yeah consistency is key you have to do it every day oh. I love it. Is there anything <laughs> I haven't asked you that you would like to share with our audience? No, I think you ask almost like everything. Life is good in Tanzania. That's all. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's hot. It's and hot. And it is it's freezing hot. in New York. I know. You guys it are cold. cold. We are hot. Yeah, I know. I appreciate you. I know our time difference has been crazy. Yes, it's almost seven. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's evening. <laughs> and I appreciate you for pouring into the community. And I just, I, I, I love this conversation. I really wanted to just get to know your story and how life was in Tanzania. And a lot of people will be super excited to just experience Tanzania just like I cannot wait I cannot wait it's on my bucket list I mean Kilimanjaro is there so hey and you actually have (laughs) on my bucket list you could no 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 you could on my bucket list on my bucket list how to climb it you could I have people who climb it they're like 70 years old 80 years old they climb it there is a trick to it so there's a line that starts like Kilimanjaro climbing Kilimanjaro is here my mom when she went to climb it so there's a line that shows you my mom stepped two foot um, two steps on the other side and then she steps I think almost like 10 or 15 steps and she was like I climbed it so that's it there's a line just don't tell people how far you went just be like once you cross over that line that's have it. A like, yes, okay. I climbed it Okay, so we climbed it. That's it. <laughs> Great. So we have a cheat sheet. I actually want yeah. to uh, climb it, climb it. One yeah. of you. When you're ready, we can do it together. Yeah. How far did you go? Mind your business. <laughs> <laughs> mind your business. Why you in mind? You go climb it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, my dear. So I will leave you with the song that I learned from Uganda. 
Okay. I'm not a good singer, but I'll sing it and then I'll explain what it says. Okay. So this the is the first. Goes, We've never had yeah, someone sing. Yes, yes. I am not a musician, but I learned it from Uganda when I was literally five, six years old. I still remember it to today. And it's always one of those songs that kind of like, I it, it kind of like every morning I wake up and sing it and it would just remind me why I am here and why I should continue going. So the song goes, mm-hmm. So the song is, in this world, what am I doing? In this world, how do I want to be remembered? In this world, what am I doing? In this world, how do I want to be remembered? So that's one thing I want to leave people. When you are stuck in that way, like in your ways, just remember how do you want to contribute in this world? What are you saying in this world? And how do you want to contribute? So that's it. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. We'll end on that note. That's it for this episode. Thank you again for lending us your ears. It's truly an honor to save each and every dreamer. You can continue to support us by liking sharing and following us on our social media pages the links are all in the show notes we have so many exciting projects and ventures in store for you until next time keep dreaming